Thursday. Massive welcome to all of you 7,958, I think, this morning, subscribers, channel members, LinkedIn watchers, and of course, first time viewers to what's going to be a highly engaging and I hope insightful session for us all today. I'm joined by Luke Keeley for another episode of the CISO Experience. And Luke serves as the Chief Information Security Officer for Get Busy and Smart Vault, where he leads the group's global information security, compliance, and risk management programs. But prior to joining Get Busy and Smart Vault, he spent 13 years in law enforcement. This period was marked by involvement in both covert and overt operations and specializing in cybercrime. And as a detective, he played a crucial role in investigating a spectrum of online criminal activities, including fraud, blackmail, extortion, and the creation and dissemination of malware and ransomware. He was also involved in efforts to combat the online abuse of children. Transitioning from law enforcement to the private sector, Luke brought a unique perspective to manage services. He's been involved in the delivery of security operations, incident response, security consultancy across a diverse range of industries, including critical national infrastructure, telecommunications, the public sector, and finance. So everyone watching, let's get those questions ready. But before we bring him on, and for those new to the channel, and apologies for those who hear this every time, my name's Simon Linstead. I'm the founder of the InfoSec Live community. And by sharing stories and best practices, we've had over 130,000 views here on YouTube. Thanks to all of you amazing subscribers. And for those that haven't subscribed yet and do enjoy our content, please do take a moment to hit that subscribe button and make sure you ring that bell to be notified of all our future shows. But let's not forget, this all started two years ago with the Global InfoSec Live community, which has now grown to 5,500 people strong and growing fast, where we have study groups, mentor sessions, and regular networking events to help you raise your game in cybersecurity with a brand new leadership-focused channel encouraging collaboration and knowledge sharing. And it would be remiss of me not to mention our amazing community-driven in-person leadership events in both the UK and US, with 24 dates released this week for 2024. Check out our events page for more information, and our next events are next week to coincide with Black Hat in London on the 5th, 6th and 7th. The 5th and the 7th are leadership events, but the 6th is a community event open to everyone, sponsored by Anecdotes. So if anyone's watching this and they're coming to Black Hat next week, we do have a couple of seats left. Send me a DM or have a look on the website. Link for that should be in the description here on YouTube. If it isn't, um, I'll drop a link in the, in the chat a bit later on. But before we get started, a special thank you to our latest channel members, Marianne, Philip Nicholas, and Carlos Guerrero. Your support is greatly appreciated. And if you'd like to support the InfoSec Live community, we do have three tiers of membership options available right here on this channel. But whether you join or not, being here and engaging with our content is what really matters. So if you're watching this live or indeed on the replay, please do like and subscribe. And as we want to make these as interactive as possible, for those tuning in live, and I see a few of you, Brian and a couple of others have already dropped them in, but drop your questions in the chat and we'll do our best to cover them all throughout or indeed at the end of the show. Now, intro over, time for the exciting bit. Let's bring Luke on. Welcome. I'm just going to simply say it. That intro is way, 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 way beyond where I'm at. So, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> do you, do you mean the do you mean the the lovely speech I gave at the start, or do you mean the graphical o orgasm of fun beforehand? Which one? Oh, the I guess the orgasmic fun. Yeah, no, that yeah. was uh, yeah. That's I don't think I've ever heard highlight. that before. Yeah. No, it's the highlights. I apologise now to everyone. <laughs> I, I did this um yesterday i had hadas casola on who's a CISO from tampa 
And the first thing she said was, have you never heard of under-promising and over-delivering, Simon? So I think there's a lesson to be learned there, maybe, Luke. <laughs> yeah. But look, th thank you for taking the time to come on. I see we've got masses of people in the audience throwing questions in already. So for everyone watching, thank you. But Luke, could we start off by, I've given a little bit of background about you. Do you mind just telling our audience a bit more about, I suppose, give you a couple of questions. One, what did you want to actually do when you left school? And two, what happened from there on? Right. So I think just to try and put a little bit of context, uh, as you hear me speak, you'll probably uh, notice that I am not from the UK. Uh, so I grew up in a, in a rural country town, arguably, if you want to call it a farm. Uh, but even as a as a kid, you know, despite having vast amounts of land and been growing up in quite, in that environment, which was like when, in the nice possible way, men were men, and that's what their perception was back there. It's proper, really, yeah. a uh, you know, a harsh environment. I would say to probably grow yeah. up, and I wanted to be a police officer, and I could not tell you why. Um, it was just something that I used to, even as a kid, used to run around and dress up like a cop, basically. And I don't know where it came from, but. You know, uh, throughout life, uh, my choices changed quite considerably. I was heavily involved into my sport, you know, ambitions to go to the Olympic Games and represent what Australia sport? and whatnot. Uh, 1500 meter track, actually. So I, I knew that, um, didn't I? Because we've had this discussion about my yeah. runs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I, I got into tech with a company called Telstra, uh, who's, you know, they're one of the largest telecoms providers in the in the um around australia really yeah uh doing technical support and then made the decision to come across to the uk worked with uh siemens fujitsu uh and on the well, let's let's uh, stop let's stop there why leave the sunshine what'd you come at this miserable hole for luke okay so let's be clear i <laughs> australia's hot um and as much as i like hot weather i don't like it that much um and yeah. if, if i'm being honest i've been here for for 20 years now and i absolutely love the uk um I love the people. I love being in around Yorkshire. I like the different cultures, the food. I like just, I like the banter. The banter is pretty good. Um, and I just like being able to experience and just pivot and jump between different countries so much easier than what you can yeah, in Australia. So that is true. Uh, yeah. This this is home for me now, for sure. Nice. It's nice to hear someone likes it here, Luke. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm only kidding. We're, we've, um, I mean, I've lived abroad before. And I think it sometimes takes to live abroad or live away from home to actually appreciate what you've got where you are. And you were saying about the rural location. I'm in a rural location now. And I think for me, I couldn't ever go back to living in civilization after that. Yeah. So my first step out of the, uh, and this will probably trigger the law enforcement question. I, my first trip out of Australia, um, I kid you not, landing into London, having never left the country before, backpack and everything on my back, uh, no idea what to expect. And I was, someone tried to rob me in the underground and I literally just got off the plane. Uh, and that was just like a string of things that happened over the course Welcome of that home. backpack holiday. Oh my God. You know, I had a string of robbery attempts and I, it was a good event, but it taught me a little bit about life. Uh, and it was a good introduction about what you can expect working in the in law enforcement for sure. Um, and did you yeah. did you work in law enforcement in down under or did you work in the UK? No, I did it here actually. I, I'm, I gained residency uh, a few years back. I worked in law enforcement, um, and yeah, that was an eye opener uh, culturally. I wasn't even ready for it. Uh, There's you know, big differences between you know, Australia and the UK, uh, and just nuances I wasn't actually ready for. But you learn very very quickly, um, not necessarily about the cultural differences, but also just about humanity uh in terms yeah. of and is there is there more is there more organized crime here or is it just differently structured or is it the same uh i, I think it's different um like we've we've got the same types of organized crime which is some are a little bit more prominent than others on either side of the country uh, and either side of the planet really but no you see a lot of the same kind of things i mean there are a lot of parallels between australia and the uk uh, in a lot of the a lot of ways uh given our relationship between the countries but you know organized crime you know it's it's everywhere you, ca you can't escape it no and i think um a lot of organized criminals have pivoted successfully into this arena right because they've seen the money making opportunities yeah it, it has definitely has i mean if you look at back into I think the first recorded spam message was back in the 1970s. I think it was like late 1970s. And if you look at how spam has turned into phishing and how yeah. cybercrime has actually monetized the use of phishing and how that's then 
elevate that into other forms of criminality in terms of the distribution, the deployment of malware and yeah. fraud and extortion. Um, you know, it really has evolved quite considerably. It has. So, I, I think I might have this wrong, but I think in it, maybe in the eighties, the first ever ransomware was the guy who had them on the floppy disks. Probably. It was. There's there's a story about it. I listened to a podcast about a year ago, and he used to get paid by bankers' draft. So he used to give the address, which is wow. a PO box. Yeah, that was the first ever case of ransomware. Put the nice. floppy disk in your computer and say goodbye to your stuff. Yeah. 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 And that's where, and that's back then when you had there was no chance of recovery. It was dead. <laughs> no. yeah, it was gone. Absolutely. Basically. You're sending the check, aren't you? You're sending the check. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what, what was it? What was it? We've got we've got a few questions coming in, but before we get to them, what was it that made you I've got a lot of friends who've um, retired from the police force, so I'm genuinely interested in this. What is it that made you go from law enforcement to the private sector? Um it, it is a hard question. I think the, the, one of the biggest drivers for me was, and I, I can't, what I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be disparaging about the police in any way. Um, being in law enforcement has 100% shaped me into the person I am today. Um, and I would arguably say I'm better for it. Um, probably worse for it at the same time. But when you well, move in, the, to, in the way, in the way that you look at everyone in a light that, maybe others don't i'm saying this because my father-in-law is a retired policeman um and it it nearly killed him if i'm perfectly honest with you i'm sure he won't mind me sharing he's he's had mental health issues um he's had a bit of a breakdown off the back of retiring from it from some of the stuff he's seen and what he's been involved with and i think you have to be a resilient kind of person to be able to deal with that i think that look that resilience comes as a natural you, you just naturally build up that wall as soon as you get exposed to some of the matters that you are going to see as part of the police and you know there are things that you can't unsee um unthink and smell um and it's you know similar it's, to what he said yeah yeah it is but you know it, i think that level of insight that i've actually taken out of the law enforcement has probably given a very different perspective around what cybercrime actually is um so just in terms of answering the question i just didn't feel like i was able to do enough uh in the police um yeah. where in the private sector i felt that i could do a similar kind of function similar kind of role without the powers of being a warranted officer but there are a lot of parallels between cyber security and law enforcement in terms of wow. you know you are acting as a protector and a defender and you are you are still going on on the attack to find and investigate so like i the police run its course for me um, and I just wanted a different challenge. Um, and the private sector has done exactly that. Um, certainly in the first five years, I've been spending nearly five, over five years now that I left. And can I, I don't know if I can ask this question or not, but I'm going to just tell me to shut up if it's too personal. What was your, what was your job role before you left the police? And what role did you go from, from the police in the private sector? So I finished as a detective sergeant uh, yeah. working in the cybercrime unit. Uh, so I worked alongside uh, the telecoms team, uh, digital forensics unit, and also the child sex offences team uh, as oh, well. Wow. So we worked in one building. So all the technology hub in that one area. Yeah. Okay. And and you left that and the first job you had in the private sector was? It was in telecoms, actually. It's a cybersecurity manager uh, for a yeah. local internet service provider. Um may or may not be local to yorkshire and owned by bt um oh, yeah. may or may not but <laughs> My bad, uh, yeah. yeah that was hands down a baptism of fire it is the most technical environment i've ever been exposed to and it set me off on a really good course because i i was working with some pr supremely technical people who made me feel like an idiot every day just by welcome, being welcome in their, their presence <laughs> <laughs> but you had to learn um yeah. And yeah, it was it was a really good experience. Um, you know, I got exposure to everything uh, in a very very short amount of time. And you know, I worked with uh, a couple of people within that organisation who you know, I, I look back and think, you know what, you have done me a favour um, yeah. uh, in a lot of ways. Actually, and I will actually I've learned a lot from those just by their practical approach to security. Practical, yeah. basic, simple approach to security. Which could, I mean, we we can dig into that, I'm sure, a bit later on in this conversation. But yeah, let's not go into that now. Let me grab, because mm. um, I want to open that can of worms just before we finish. <laughs> let, let me bring up some of the questions um, that we've had in here. So Prashant, I'll bring yours up first. 
was doing cyber detective work enjoyable? And then I think the second part of the question we've already answered. So the first bit, was doing cyber detective work enjoyable? It was really enjoyable. You know, the thing is uh, that I gained from that, I actually got up close and personal and actually got to see what a cyber criminal actually is. This whole perception of some hooded teenager sucking on a can of Red Bull, thumping around a laptop in a dark room, it's absolute bollocks. It's, the, it's like um, an, it's an organized business structure is what it is. Yeah. Well, yeah, but, but even more so, when you look at cybercrime in its, in its most basic level, if you look what the internet does, and I'm just going to deviate for a second, I'm going to come yeah. back. The internet allows you to do things you otherwise cannot do in in like in the real world in the traditional world and there's also a an element of uh, disinhibition where people feel a lot more comfortable to do yeah. things on the internet that they wouldn't do in the physical would someone break into someone's house and steal you know valuable goods and money no they wouldn't but you still find that people are doing a similar kind of thing that theft fraud dishonesty is still doing it through the internet because a you can get away it's, with it a lot easier distance and it's all you know there's that is an element of being detached um so seeing people from university students you're looking at um teachers professionals you know these are people who are committing cyber crime you know and a variety of different things from fraud um denial of service using you know, ddos as a service um obviously the, the online abuse was a, was a, a prominent feature as well but the thing is, though, it did, I could be looking at you right now and you 100% could be a hacker or a cyber criminal. And it's just like you just got to take it on face values that it's, you just it's brilliant. It's, it's brilliant. You've said that. Let me show you why, because the next question I was going to bring up is this one. If you were still a detective and you saw Simon for the first time, would you hug him or suspect him? I think everyone knows I'm not a mastermind. No, no, I've got, I can answer on. that. Yeah. I would put the handcuffs on you and then I would hug you. Um, <laughs> Brilliant, yeah. Just in case I bit, was that what it was? Well, it's not even that well. To be fair, you'd be face down when you did it. But um, <laughs> so I was going to say, it wouldn't be the first time, and that would be quite inappropriate, wouldn't it? Yeah, I, look, it, it, and I, guess, I suppose what I'm going to say is this: the police has given me uh, a level of. I wouldn't say it's necessarily helpful, but just look at the people in a different way, and you know that trust element is a very hard thing to achieve for me now. Um, okay. But. I heard something really interesting a while back and it really resonated that and it's quite extreme is that anybody's capable of doing serious harm to another person in the right circumstance on the wrong day and i 100 percent believe that that's the cape you know that the, everybody's got that capability um you know it's it's a great conversation but that's just my my opinion i i, I think i completely agree um emotions can drive people to do things that they'd never do normally absolutely um, yeah and i think but then you, you flip that on the other side. And I know people who are inherently bad, I think. And some of them mask it quite well, but others not terribly well. And mm. I suppose they're quite easy to spot from a mile off for you now. Luke. There are some traits. Yeah. <laughs> there are some traits, but you know, never judge a book by its cover. Um, That's true. Gotta at least flick through and look at the in, the inside front page first. You gotta look at the index, yeah. You gotta get an yeah. idea about what, what I'm what I'm about to read. Um, <laughs> okay. So. Ne next one then, if that's okay. Um, Brian from Puerto Rico. If you were to start everything again from scratch, but with your current knowledge and experience, which route would you take to get you to the place you are now in terms of position and market value? Always a good question from Brian. Thanks, Brian. You know what? In hindsight, I don't think I would do anything different because I don't think if I'd stayed in technology, I invariably would have followed a different course of action. I would have ended well, yeah. one, I probably would have stayed in Australia and never come to the UK. The thing with having been in law enforcement, it gave, it, I walked away with a lot of really positive skills. I think that I, you know, I've definitely trans transferred those into my current role. And I'll give you a really good example, actually. I was actually um, interviewed in my first role, and they asked me about a scenario where I had to... Tell me, give me a scenario where you've had to deal with a risky situation. And my... But the thing is, bear in mind, this is a technical interview, and I went straight off piste, and I thought, I didn't know anything technical. I talked about a suicide intervention. Um, and it's like, well, if, you talk, if you're talking about risk, let's go let's, let's take it to the nth risk. degree yeah. and that was the thing and i even got the feedback and that was the thing that made that sealed the deal in that yeah. if you can take that level of risk and bring it backwards 
then we think you might be okay with and, dealing with... And I think with... it show, shows the measure of your character of dealing with situations under under intense pressure as well, especially... Oh, I wouldn't want to do it being, again. Being wrong, able but, to leave no. your emotions at the door must be extremely difficult when you're dealing with things like that. Well, it's a 24-7 job. It's hard to do that. <laughs> that is very true. Okay, next so, question. Oh, yeah, sorry. I don't think I'd change, basically. No. I, don't, I think, I mean, I've, I've made some terrible mistakes in my life and... I suppose the worst ones, the worst one would be when I self-destructed and destroyed everything. And the, the reason that was the worst one is because it affected a lot of people around me, especially my family. Um, however, that being said, I wouldn't change a thing either because I never would have become the person I am now if I hadn't have gone through a bit of adversity, if I hadn't have made some really stupid mistakes, if, as my late grandmother used to say, if I hadn't hung around with dogs and got fleas, because that's what happens when you hang around with the wrong people right sure so yeah sometimes you need you need a bit of a shock to the system to realize that so i'd give the same answer to that question which my wife would probably be horrified by but hopefully no i look it. i 100 percent agree you know there's been everybody has probably got some uh skeletons or have done things that they wish they could turn back but you are yeah. invariably going to be a much stronger person i wouldn't say better yeah. stronger person as a result of things that Agreed. you have have done and so, i think i think it helps you um helps you align what success really is and it helps you understand what's important to you and it, it certainly did for me <clears throat> i don't want to get too deep about it and this isn't about me so i'll shut up but let's go on to the next question here we go crash on again if you could create a security framework for a global corporate community what would you say is the top five must do's Another good question. So I'm not going to talk about the product I've been developing that may or may not actually help with that. But I think you I will, probably should. No, I will. Uh, <laughs> I'll, it's not finished yet. So we'll, we'll, leave, um, we'll leave that for next year. Yeah. Yeah. So look, I think security frameworks. Um, I favour uh, frameworks like ISO twenty seven thousand and one, and the reason being is that it gives you a really good starting point. It's flexible and it's customized to the needs of what you, what the organization needs. Yeah. I'm not going to bash Cyber Essentials, but I'm gonna. I really dislike Cyber Essentials insofar that it's too yeah. overly prescriptive and it makes it very hard for certain organizations to be compliant. Yeah. Um, and invariably, you are pushing them into a place where they're probably gonna have to bend the truth just to get that tick in the or, box. Or just lie, yeah. Or, or you, okay, you're saying it straight up, basically. <laughs> I, I get the point of Cyber Essentials and there is a 100% value in it, but it's too prescriptive for my liking. But if you were to look at a combination of ISO 27000 as a framework, combine that with NIST controls, which are a little bit more technical in detail, CIS controls, and use that as the balance about how you actually achieve your... I think you've got a really good framework there. So for me, those combinations is great. I would look at specifically a risk management framework as a as an absolute core requirement, a good incident response framework, business continuity, and then to un, you know underpin it with with technology that works and plays well together. Um, I will you know, we talk about cybersecurity and it tends to be focused quite heavily on the the technical aspects of being secure. Yeah. You got to look at inf, you know information security. The the pertinent word, the operational word there is information. And I think InfoSec has got a much bigger part to play about how you secure an organization. That's where the policies, the process, the procedures come into play. And I, and I completely agree from a, a layman's perspective, but from having governance oversight controls in a regulated environment before where everything's driven by process and people, um, it was a bit of a shock coming into this industry where everything seems to be driven by technology, which makes sense because it's a tech industry. But I think from a industry mature maturing point of view, it's got a little way to go as yet. Do you think? Yeah. So if you look at, uh, I think a lot of this has been driven since 2018. So if you look at with the GDPR came in, yeah. and then you have the California Consumer Privacy Act, those pieces of legislation on the UK and US respectively really kickstarted a, a big change um, across Europe and the states. And if you look at the implement so we've got the nist 2 directive the nist 2 is coming next year you've got the eu cyber resilience act coming in there's more governance around what we're doing now and i think they're really positive changes yeah. what about dora is that going to affect what you do because that comes in next year isn't it it does yeah dora is going to be quite a big one actually um so even though the uk 
you know, isn't necessarily affected by these piece of legislation since Brexit. They are, they're going to feel the heat of it because, you know, they, they have to remain parallel. They have to remain in alignment with the EU because that relationship is still there, even if we're in or out of the EU. Yeah. So, yeah, you've I, got I the AI you, Act. By the way. You did? I didn't. No, no. Oh, okay. No, I, didn't. I won't tell you what I did then. <coughs> no. Okay. <laughs> I don't know. It was... um. It was more for me around not believing the bullshit that was being spouted by the politicians on how rosy it would be, not having not really any underlying fundamental solidity around my decision making other than the lack of trust in what was being said at the time. Um, Is that what a CISO's I, role to admit to do, though? A little bit, yeah. I mean, I've, I've voted conservative all my life, um, but I've got to be honest with you, I'm struggling with that right now. So let's move away from politics before I ruin yeah. any chances of any work ever <laughs> in the future. And we've got lots of people in the US watching. So let's not jump into politics because it tends to be a bit of a bit of a can of worms if we open that one up. Um, going back to what we were talking about earlier, you said about how many skills there were. And I know for a fact, there's a couple of people watching this who come from a law enforcement background who are looking to mm. break in. Mm. When did you realize or did you always know that those skills were transferable? I, I guess so. I mean, I think for those who are in law enforcement, they, they're going to understand it is actually a really big jump um, to leave the police because you're, you know, you may be commercially tied into it, depending on how much service you've got. Yeah, you're also emotionally invested into it as well. Because you know, for the most part, people who have, I would say people who've been in law enforcement probably longer than 10 years, you know, it's it becomes almost a, a lifelong career. Um, not so much now, I don't believe with people now joining i think it's not seen as you're going to be doing it until you're 65 and the zimmer frame but isn't but isn't um, that isn't that society in general now compared to what it used to be you know you go and get a job you work there for 30 years get your final salary pension then leave yeah 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 you're probably right i think there's it's that that stigma about having from job hopping i think is now gone and i think that's a good thing um i had you know had five jobs in my first five years of yeah. leaving uh the police and you know, I, I must admit, and I'm at my parents' laws now. You know, when they looked at what I was doing, thinking, um, "Are you going to make sure that my uh, my daughter's going to be safe with you?" Because you were changing jobs quite a lot. Yeah. And, the, and the thing is, though, preparing and and the, it, it was good that they were putting that under that pressure because it made me think very carefully about: Am I doing it for the right reasons? And I'm thinking, "Yeah, I am." And each of the changes that I made and I pivoted, though, I did it for a specific reason. Yeah. Um, and you know, again, I wouldn't change anything because I gained a lot of insight and a lot of skills and met a lot of different people over there that have influenced and shaped me into how I operate today in cybersecurity. It, it's about being open and taking the opportunities when they come as well, I think. Yeah, absolutely. It's, yeah, absolutely. It's, which is which is a big thing, I think, for career progression in general. We, we were talking about career progression yesterday, you know, people coming into the industry and want to be CISOs before they've even got, you know, the first qualifications, that's the aspiration. But it's important to know what you actually enjoy doing and whether that role is going to correlate into that. And I know a lot of people wow. who are technical, think they want to be a leader, but when they get into that position, they find out, well, actually, just because everyone said that was the next step for me, perhaps management or leadership isn't for me. I'd rather go back to doing what I was doing before. Yeah, I'm really glad you brought that up, Shapley. And I think that's, you know, introspectively, so people should probably look at their personality type um, so. when they look at things within cybersecurity. Now, pen testing, on the face of it, exciting flash, you know, at the you know at the tip of the spear kind of cybersecurity. I couldn't be that. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> I couldn't do it because my brain doesn't work that way. I don't like sitting on a cold ass floor in a data center for hours on end running a script that, you know, it doesn't float my boat. I would much rather be a defender. Um, it's just the way I'm built. Um, yeah. You know, I first saw that with. Uh, do you remember Michael Johnson, who used to be the 200 and 400 meter? Yeah, certainly absolute do. Yeah, hero of mine. Yeah. I read his book and he was uh, he was a sprinter uh, and his mind set was sprinting and he used to absolutely hate doing weight training because he says like I'm finding it boring but he did it just as a as a matter of course because he had to for that right foundation and that's why I think if you're going to go into cybersecurity just try and work play to your strengths and work out what personality type is probably going to be more conducive to a successful career um I think so I think that's you, could, you could put that you could put that across um yeah, absolutely. Industry or, or any job, I think. I mean, and it resonates with me because I came in 
thinking I wanted to be a penetration tester, but had I taken the time to actually realize that 60% of your time is taking up writing reports, which I've always hated, and the other yeah. 40% is sitting on those cold, hard floors or sitting at your desk or someone's desk all day in front of a laptop. Yeah. I never would have done that. But I think for me, I was mesmerized by the red teaming aspect of it. Yeah. But didn't know enough about the industry that I couldn't just swan in and kind of do that straight away. However, if anyone's looking for physical red team people to try and talk their way into buildings, I am open for day rates. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, I don't know, it's, it's back to that mindset, isn't it? I've, al yeah. I've always tried to cheat the system, I think, throughout my mm. life in different ways. And it it's a bit of a game and it becomes... I don't know, it's fun, which is why I thought I wanted to be a penetration tester, doing things for the right reason, but still living mm. on the edge, mm. I think mm. is what it is. When really all I'm good at is talking at people constantly. So I'm just going to stick with that, I think. <laughs> Social engineering instead. It's, it's what it is, isn't it? I mean, I don't know if yeah, I told you how, how I got in, but I was... Um, I was a social engineer. I was pretending to be my 12 year younger, more attractive wife on Facebook, selling her video marketing services. I didn't have a Facebook account. I wasn't working. I was helping her and introduced myself to a pen tester who'd set up his own business. That's how I got my first job. Obviously, I told him straight away that I'm not Laura and I don't have long, dark hair, but, um, but it worked. Anything goes these days. <laughs> it does. <laughs> Let's not go there. Yeah. <laughs> um, another question. Where is it? Just saw one come in, which is a good one, especially for the community. For those that are new to cyber or infosec, what would you say would be things they should know, do before or during the application process for a role? I think we've ticked off the first bit. Know thyself before we do anything. Yeah. Um, so I like most of a lot of other candidates out there i took a, it took me a long time to get out of the police actually find that job i mean it, it, bear in mind i am i'm not cis certified nor will i ever be cis certified because again another conversation for today i'm a little a bit averse to certifications to an extent and i'll quant i can quantify that in another yeah. conversation it took a while to get out the thing i found with the interviews that i have done is really being able to evidence of not what you can do but how you can do it and when you've actually done it so if you if you can talk about the capability and maturity model and then you overlay that with the nist understanding and how you've actually applied that that circumstantial piece of information that evidence you can give carries a lot more weight in saying yeah i know cmm i know iso 27000 it's the actual application of it which is the thing that starts to carry more weight well let's stick on um, that let's let's stick on that because certifications in my opinion are one of the biggest blockers to this industry progressing from where it is today i think we need we need a measuring stick which is what certifications are but we also need to have that hands-on experience that allows you to apply what you've learned through the study yeah to be actually and this, useful in the workplace uh, this is where i feel the candidates unfortunately now are really up against it and this and this is more about the hiring practices i think which are the things that cause a problem rather than the certifications recent example so i've we recently hired someone who in the job description i asked for no certifications i said desirable you know i'm just like i couldn't care less if you're cis certified and more so it, it, it didn't really matter i was i'm judging you the person and what you can offer to me and the team and are you going to be the right cultural fit have you got that potential that I can see that's going to take you to being better than me who can teach me in things that I don't know about yeah. um, and that's the route that I've taken and I think the unfortunate thing is people trying to break into the industry or trying to move out is that mindset's just not there yet um, and I think some people don't even know what they're actually wanting to hire for so it's just easier to use an AI tool or look at the CV and say certs yep tick 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 looks good on paper rather than doing the hard work and saying, is this person the right fit for me in my team and the organization? And do you think we always blame, um, we always blame HR, hiring managers. Do, do you think the leadership in organizations needs to take a little bit of ownership for that as well, considering they're the ones who want the people in? Um, potentially, I suppose it depends on what leadership are actually being involved in the recruitment process. You know, I would never blame HR because ultimately they're, they're, they're the tool, they're the mechanism yeah. to go and find the candidates and go through the process. They should be fed the information of what they should be looking for. Uh, again, when I've used our people in culture and HR team, I've told them the kind of candidates that I'm specifically looking for and, and given them a crib sheet that if they're going to telephone interview them, 
ask them these really basic questions first. Um, you know, what's an IP address? You know, if you can't work that out and you think, well, you struggle to turn on a light switch, maybe you're not the right fit. But okay, it's just to get past you. that. Oh, yeah. It's just trying to get past that little technical hurdle. Um, but that was the, the extent of it. it was really, really basic foundational knowledge that I needed just to make sure, yeah, we are talking to someone who could you know, hit the ground running and then it became it became my problem it was more of a behavioral in- interview after that well let's let's stick on let's stick on that the comment about foundational knowledge so you hear different opinions from people online about what an entry level position is in cyber security and again the boot camps and training providers out there make it look like you can do a six to twelve week course and then become a penetration tester if only you part with eight thousand dollars or pounds to the training provider do you think in reality, an entry level role in cyber means that you have to understand networking, you have to understand the fundamentals of it, or do you think that's wrong? It depends on the role you're going to uh, go for is what I would say. Um, a lot of entry level positions tend to be working in a security operation center because yeah. you know, there's a high churn, the opportunities are a lot easier to get into a SOC, um, and therefore your requirements around basic network infrastructure, basic security infrastructure. I like that. Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I think the fundamentals for that kind of role, absolutely. Um, doing boot camps, let's just look at what a boot camp is. It is compressed knowledge in a short amount of time that's geared specifically to help you pass an exam. Yeah. So how much of that compressed knowledge do you really walk away with that you can then apply later on in your career and i, I would probably question how much you would I, be able i'd to also play. just caveat um because i spend a lot of time slagging off boot camps and i just want to caveat this assassination i do on though i've done boot camps before and i've successfully used them to pass exams in financial services but it wasn't a case of me starting from scratch and doing a boot camp it was me trying to pass a bloody investment certificate exam three times and i struggled mm. with it i had the knowledge just couldn't pass the exam. So I did a two week boot camp twice, yeah. one on tax and trusts, one on investments to get me over the line to get me to pass that exam. Because I struggle with exams. I always have, always have done. So I think there's a there's a place for them, but they're not framed correctly in this industry. You know, that it isn't there isn't a one size fits all approach. Yeah, look, I, I'm not gonna say, I think there are a lot of value there is value in certifications for sure. Yeah. Um but should they be the measure, the benchmark uh, by which to assess a candidate? Absolutely not. No. In my opinion. No, I agree. Sorry, I'm trying to type and talk at the same time, um, which is very difficult. I was just replying to Alana's comment. She said, I remember next to nothing from my ITIL bootcamp. Granted, it was over a decade ago. The next day, I could probably barely tell you what ITIL means. Um, I can't remember what I ate for my dinner yesterday, Alana, so I shouldn't worry about it too much. Um, I believe you, IT Information Library. <laughs> so, there we go. Hey, see? And it flies on you. Um, Paul Rogers, good question. What are some interview questions that you like to ask or be asked? Um, I like the situational ones because I've got a ton of them. Um, and invariably, I will overlay with the behavioral skills. And when I talk about behavioral problem solving, effective communication, teamwork, personal responsibility, um, and, and and literally just surround the technical problem that you're probably asking me and say, this is how I solve it with this, 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 and this. Because you're not just answering a technical question on, yeah, this time I helped, it's this time I did, and this is how I did it. And yeah. if you think, if you're going to solve a problem for you, who else can you solve that problem for? And I can solve it for my colleague, my team, my department, my business, the, the community. And that way you're showing a much broader um, collaborative approach, which I think gets overlooked a lot of the time. That You're going to blow the socks off if you start throwing the behavioral competencies at someone during the course of an interview. That's a very good point. And how do you cope with, um... <clears throat> so there's a, a lot of people are quite introverted in this industry who really don't cope with interview situations very well. Um, if you were interviewing for a role where an introverted person would be ideal, for which there are many of in cybersecurity, would you give them any slack during that interview process? Would you approach it differently? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I yeah. don't think you should be, don't get me wrong, I think there should be a standard set of questions. How you yeah. deliver that should really be different. And I think the interviews has got to be flexible for the candidate you're faced with. Yeah. You know, granted, there are going to be some types of roles that have to be a little bit more 
prescriptive, a little bit more rigid. Um, but, you know, if I had, uh, yeah, look, my approach will be different from person to person. Um, but you're still going to get the uh, same thing. So I'm going to get that information out of you one way or another. It just might take a little bit longer to get it from some other candidates and others. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, that's thumb, my thumb screws, thumb screws out back to the old job, was it? No, I tend to use pliers, really. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> kidding, kidding, yeah. I'm kidding. Um, Steve Hump, good to see you here. I think this is the first or second one you've tuned in. Thanks for tuning in, Steve. It's put collaboration is the prerequisite to getting buy-in. I mean, I think I, I think we all agree with that. And I'm, I'm going to ask you um, my own question now. We've only got about three or four minutes left, but I want to ask this one, which is what are the, the what's the top skill you think you need as a chief information security officer? Uh, communication um, slash collaboration slash problem solving slash slash <laughs> no, look, I, I, I will say this hand on heart and um, the role of a CISO is so widely misunderstood um, and I will openly say I get sick and tired of seeing it's all about the CISO. CISOs must be doing this. CISOs must. It's not about that. You're, you're, what about the director of IT, director of security, right. or the head of security who are performing the same function as a CISO? Uh, I just think there's too much emphasis on a CISO, and I must admit, I specifically hated now that this new FTC rules coming out, which is saying you are going to be getting your neck on the block if you screw things up. And I mean so, that without wanting to be mean here, um, and this is going to sound quite mean. Careful what you ask for, right? Because oh uh, yeah. The industry has been saying we want a seat at the board table for a long time. And as someone who's been sat at the board table before, who knows what responsibility and potential damage comes with that. It's yeah, not yeah. something I'd wish for with frivolity, if I'm perfect. I do. Um, I just want to answer Brian's other question here. Describe the ideal CISO based on your experience. Oh, I'm going to well I'm describe the best role for me. I love being hands-on. I love messing around with the platforms. I love involved, being involved in InfoSec, CyberSec, data protection, risk management, vulnerability management, DevSecOps, the works. I want to be involved in everything because I love working with other teams and other people and watching things. You know, when you've got two different teams who have never worked before, now getting them to work in a way which is conducive and more efficient than they've worked before. I absolutely love seeing that happen. So, um, was, yeah, well, my, my, last, my last question was going to be, um, what what puts a smile on your face from doing the job? Well, maybe you just answered that. Uh, development, and I say development yeah. in terms of the colleagues, the business. You know, I just like seeing growth, and not necessarily the business, but also just seeing people around me. You know, learn by my mistakes, learn by my face. I love learning from other people. I like being shown yeah. that I'm an idiot. It's, it's much better to learn from other people's mistakes time to time. as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, Steve, Steve's made a good, a really good point here because something else you see or hear a lot of in the industry is the board fail to engage, the board fail to do this. It's really difficult. S storytelling is super important, right? And as Steve said, it's our responsibility to enrol the board in what we're doing rather than use it as an excuse that they're not engaging. Maybe we need to look at ourselves a little bit there. Yeah, I think this engagement thing is going to become a thing of the past. Uh, I don't think you're going to see this whole the CISO needs a board at the table. I think that's naturally going to happen. I think it's, I think we might be dwelling on that probably a little bit too much now. If you look at the sheer volume of startups, the modernization of, and transformation of companies now, security is front and center of that. Uh, and if they haven't done it, then they're idiots. Um, but I think that problem is going to go to a go away very very quickly. Yeah, no, I think I think you're from my limited knowledge. I think you're right as well. Um, I wasn't going to take any more questions, but Phil's sent thanks for pointing it out brian you know how crap my eyes are don't you he sent a two-part question here which is pretty good first part is how do you find interactions with the other c-suite and how do you engage them with security um i'm not saying it because they're probably not even listening but the the ceo the cfo and the president that i work with respectively are absolutely outstanding um you know they have 100% embraced security. They've given me the flexibility to deliver what I feel is the right thing for them. Um, yeah, I, yeah, I, it's been easy for, it's been like pushing an open door. So I'm okay. in a very, without, very, without wanting position. to, without wanting to get you to say anything that's going to get you in trouble at work. Um, <laughs> is it a regulated industry that you work in? What was the, why, why are they so different to other organizations in the fact that they care? I think the question is. 
I, I couldn't honestly tell you. I think we, we support regulated industries, specifically yeah. the accounting and financing and banking sector. Yeah, um, so it's business enablement as much as anything else, isn't it? Oh, hundred percent. But, but yeah. you know, they've got to be, they've got to embrace compliance and security because it is, a, it enables us to be able to sell into that market of yeah. which they have to be compliant with compliance and security. So, yeah. you know, it makes sense for them to be up to speed with what needs to happen. So that's. Okay. Yep. And second, second part of Phil's question. There's so many questions coming through. I can't actually keep up with them. Here we go. And boom. <clears throat> and how do you build a security culture that supports ISO and other frameworks? That's a good question. Um, security culture. Um, I, I'm going to say it and people will probably disagree with it. I don't like the term security culture. Um, if I'm being honest, it's just because culture. If you, it is culture. It's a business culture. It's a it's a it's a secure mindset because what other kind of culture do you have in the business? Do you have a HR culture? Do you have a finance culture? Do you have a dev culture? You have a bit of a well, sales culture, unfortunately. Well, you, you, you know what I mean. But in, in <laughs> terms <too>. of, <laughs> so I, what I would say is, I'd say security awareness. Um, I like storytelling. Um, yeah. We recently did a red team engagement against the entire enterprise, um, and doing doing the show and tell about this is how it starts outside and this is how it feels and looks on the inside in and actually taking through that journey of what a hack could look like you know that was that really resonated with the workforce and they got they saw that um but i think we need to you know broadcast when people do things well and yeah. not bash the whole this yeah. the, the the weakest link it's rubbish <laughs> it's yeah, it's just it's, it's a silly statement um humans are the best ally it's easy to 100%. hack a human but they're also frontline defenders. So, In, well, uh, take, taking that on board, then. So, a lot of the security awareness training that I've seen is very focused on the corporate environment, obviously, because that's what the training is for. Do you think we need to make it more personally relatable when it comes to security awareness training? So, putting it in. I suppose in the context of what would happen in your home environment, perhaps, or I don't think you can't because if you look at the uh, distributed workforce now since COVID, we've got more people working from home, more people using BYOD, and if you can translate personal into business, business into personal, that cross pollination of training will benefit you are on either side. Yeah. But if you bring your personal laptop and your personal device in there, and you've been looking at some unsavory material on your phone and laptop, and you're bringing that in, you know you need to change that mindset about when it weren't when and are you not working um yeah. so a pri I, I private think, um, private browser window doesn't mean private my friends <laughs> <laughs> different conversation different so is yeah i'm gonna we're, we're pretty much out of time so i'm gonna finish off with actually this is one of our first members of our community two and a half years ago who joined paul rogers who's in a leadership position in the us i don't know if you're still with northrop grumman or whether you've moved on but paul's comment is this a lot of the problem with cyber is the misunderstanding of cyber and the people that do it would you agree i do i do yeah. and i think i think i would even say there's actually a misunderstanding of why people in cyber the people doing it i think that's, that's what you misunderstand it so yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, where do you see um what what changes do you see in the industry over the next five years as it matures i i think compliance is going to be embraced uh, I think compliance is actually a positive thing. There is positive change from compliance. It's going to drive businesses to do better. Um, so I think compliance is going to be a favorable thing to have to demonstrate that you are good at what you do. Um, I would like to see the whole skills gap conversation, which may or may not be trending at the moment, um, <laughs> for us to actually find a solution for, uh, for that, to help candidates and help businesses address this so-called problem. Um, and you know, I just, I just, I just think we're just going to get a lot better at doing what we're doing. And I do think that compliance is going to be a lot, a driver behind it. Particularly if you look at the, what just quickly, it has, it look, has been in every industry as it matures though, hasn't it? Let's be honest. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So if you look at the white house's cybersecurity strategy of this year, they were very, very specific about doing certain very sick things. And it's all about protecting their economy at the end of the day. And I, I really like the way they're going. Um, yeah. so I thought they did a lot of good things there. I think, I think Alana's comment. And I know you've got a call straight after this, so I'm going to keep this as brief as I can with my ADHD riddled brain. Are we maturing? Um, my opinion, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. Whereas you look at the breach reports that we keep seeing from all these vendors who are touting all these tools, we're spending more and more money every year. We're not seeing any improvement on it. When's that going to stop? Uh, it'll probably stop when we stop listening to vendors and their 
uh, crappy stats, I would say. Why, why are they why are they pushing that? But that's the thing. Is this because the whole the whole industry is built around or the vendor industry? And again, I'm not talking about oh, the sponsors here, of course. But it's fear, uncertainty, and doubt oh, is what's being used, right? When yep. really it's back to what we were talking about five minutes ago. Focus on the business enablement side of it, because that's a much more powerful message to a CEO than trying to scare them with some figure that means absolutely fuck all to them. Excuse my French. No, I, I think, agree. Yeah. Luke, um, we're going to have to wrap it up there because one, my kids are all screaming outside the door. I don't know if you can hear that, but I need to go out there and tell them off. And secondly, we're out of time and you've got another meeting. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on. Pleasure. Thank you to everyone in the audience as well for the questions. And I hope to get you get to meet you in, in real life soon. And I think you might even be coming back on the show to talk about one of the issues that we've mentioned today. <laughs> if anyone's yeah. brave enough, right? Uh, yeah, look, if anybody wants to step up and uh, contribute to a panel discussion about the, the skills gap and how we can actually fix the problem, you know, I'm on LinkedIn, reach out. Ah, that was what I meant to do. So I've already got it here. Do you mind if I drop your LinkedIn profile in the chat? Yeah, go for that it. question yeah, yeah. already. Negative affirmation, sure. boom, there we go. Right, everyone, thank you so much. Luke, thank you for taking the time to come on. Enjoy the rest of your day, everyone. And we're back tomorrow night, I think, actually, at 6 p.m. Uh, here in the UK, 1 p.m. Eastern time with the Adeptus Group, who are pretty big global recruiters. They're going to come on and help our audience with advice on CVs, resumes, interview questions, etc. So if I don't see you before, see you tomorrow. And again, Luke, thank you very much. Thank you.